welcome our friends from GARP for this uh, virtual forum, actually the sixth since we started back in 2020. It's hard to believe. Uh, a warm welcome to those uh, members of the public watching on live stream on our YouTube channel. Uh, the IEF's core mission is energy security through dialogue, and this series speaks directly to this topic, looking ahead at risks facing the global energy market. If we look at the latest data published by Jody, the energy data group coordinated by the IEF, we can already see the rebound in energy demand from China in November. That was the, when the data, the, the recent release is for November. And so that's even before the lifting of their uh, zero COVID policy. And of course, Europe looks to be surviving this winter, but risks of supply shortages continue to haunt the markets in both gas and oil with continuing concerns about the outlook for uh, Russian output. So today's energy markets update is very timely as we look at uh, 2023. Uh, let me also plug next month's uh, IFIA OPEC annual outlook symposium that will be held in Riyadh on February 15th, when, we, when we'll look at the short, medium, and, and long-term outlooks uh, by these agencies and others, including uh, some, some people joining us today, some of the speakers today. Um, and those sessions will also be live streamed, and you can get more information and register on the IEF website at IEF.org. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to our partner at uh, GARP, uh, Rich Apostolic, and uh, ask you to say a few words. Joe, thanks. And uh, I want to thank all of you here for attending this checkup program, as it's called. And, you know, I keep looking back at the in-person gathering that we had in Madrid last year, which is, you know, I've been involved, GARP has been involved in these similar types of programs for over the last 13 years. And frankly, that was one of the more interesting discussions that I've attended. And I left the program, I was pretty excited about continuing the forum as a regular series and in partnership with the IEF. And pretty gratified that obviously Joe and the IEF has felt the same way. And it seems like we're not the only ones, given that all of you are here today. The issues I think that Ed and the panelists are planning to raise today are really fascinating. They're timely and they're really important. The geopolitical risks are increasing, not diminishing. The Ukrainian conflicts fallout has been material. And there appears to be quite a bit more uncertainty that's going to be coming. The energy transition is, in my personal view, a Bit of a mess in terms of understanding the boundaries people have to work within. And again, in my view, the unreasonable expectations surrounding the world's ability to move away from fossil fuels under the calendar that many are advocating, especially given the increasing demand for energy. How quickly alternative energy sources can be developed and made available without power disruptions is a question, in addition to the consequential costs associated with the energy transition in terms of economic fallout, social and capital demands, among other factors. There are major uncertainties surrounding the future of the energy industry and the role central banks, banks, asset managers, and other financial organizations will be taking over the coming years in terms of financing and providing other commitments to the energy sector. And how we resolve the conflict between energy security and climate concerns, which seems to be on a collision course, is a topic that's not going to be growing old. Additionally, there's also a need for clear and consistent messages from policymakers around the energy transition so companies and customers can adapt it to whatever the new normal may turn out to be. How all this relates to the energy markets now and in the future is really a fascinating question. The global energy industry will respond to the challenges. I don't think anyone thinks otherwise, but forums like this are really valuable for the sharing of information, ideas, and to discuss ways forward. GARP is really happy to be part of this discussion. I look forward to today's program and to our in-person meeting in Paris in June later this year. And with these brief comments, I'll turn it back over to whoever is next online. Thanks, I think that's me, Ed Morse uh, from <laughs> Citigroup. And I, I'm gonna be moderating this panel. I wanted to make some similar introductory remarks and emphasize that uh, what the world is confronting in terms of energy, but particularly oil and natural gas markets, is fairly unprecedented. Uh, we came off a year which, in our judgment, was the first major crisis of the energy transition, where over-reliance, particularly in the power grid on renewables, whether in China, North America, or Europe, uh, turned out to be problematic when the wind stopped blowing in Europe, when there were droughts and lack of the hydropower uh, in the southern hemisphere in Brazil, and the northern hemisphere in China, 
Uh, China had rolling blackouts by September of 2021 uh, and finally had to put a close to a lot of energy intensive industries to enable people uh, in residential and commercial uh, structures to have power to do their uh, business and to be comfortable. Um, and then we had uh, Russia Ukraine, which was uh, among the most disruptive distortionary effects that we've ever seen in global markets. Uh, before the Russia Ukraine crisis began, we had three major um, pro producers in the market, the US, Saudi Arabia, and Russia. Uh, uh, they were following mostly market principles, not entirely. I'd say of the best adherence to the market principles were uh, <coughs> Russia selling oil, uh, gas is a little bit trickier to whoever the highest bidder was. And they were basically neighboring countries with short distance, whether by pipeline or, or tanker, uh, to make it economic for that uh, country to be a, a massive supplier of some um, two and a half million barrels a day of crude and uh, a little bit lower level of, uh, uh, of, of petroleum products. Uh, when we entered the year a year ago, uh, about 20% uh, of Russia's uh, oil, crude oil exports were going to Asia, the rest of other parts of the world, mostly Europe. The world ended with 70% of Russia's um, production going to uh, Asia because of sanctions that have been imposed. We're about to see in a few days a new array, array of sanctions on uh, product markets. We'll be talking about that uh, a bit. Uh, but uh, these events that we've had are more than a forewarning of what the unexpected might unfold, not just this year, but maybe for the decade ahead. Uh, I think what we're going to do uh, is note, I'm going to note uh, as my final comment before opening it up to the speakers to make uh, individual three minute uh, uh, statements of uh, what they think are the most important issues. Uh, I, I'm, I've got a favorite person to quote these days, uh, Noriel Rabini, a uh, well-known economist who at Davos said that uh, the world is entering uh, uncharted territory. Uh, this is a system that we're confronting globally, politically and geopolitically, that smacks much more of the 30 years between the First and Second World War with all of the upheaval, all of the testing of rules, than it does the more peaceful, orderly uh, world that we've had since the end of the Second World War. Uh, for the next 10 minutes, I'm going to invite each of our panelists in alphabetical order by first name to uh, tell us what they think uh, the most significant issues are, and then we'll get into a deeper dive conversation. So we'll start with you, Amrita Sen, uh, from Energy Aspects. Thank you, Ed. Always a pleasure to uh, be on a panel where which you are chairing. I always enjoy the discussions and thank you uh, to Garp and IEF for, for having me. Um, you've pretty much named the the kind of events or, or things to watch out for. I would say uh, for us, how we are looking at the market, uh, the number one uh, issue I would, uh, I would put is around China. China's reopening is very, very critical for energy across the board, oil and gas. I mean, LNG is, is going to be uh, equally affected. Um, I, if you think about the oil market last year, China's crude imports were about one and a half million barrels per day lower uh, than average kind of levels. At times they were much lower uh, than one and a half. At times they were about a million lower. But even if you take a lower end of that number, a million barrels per day, uh, when with their demand normalizing this year, we are going to get that million barrels per day coming back at the very least, depending on estimates that you believe uh, that number could be higher. Right. And we have already seen and, and Joe mentioned this already in his opening remarks, demand is starting to pick up. The thing is, there's still high COVID cases. The Chinese New Year is actually going on right now. So we haven't even seen the real impact of the reopening, right? Um, I, I would like to kind of remind all of us, you know, when the West reopened, we saw every index, be, be the ISM, be it all the kind of travel indices, they surged, US, Europe, Singapore, we've, we've seen that like time after time in all these countries, and China will not be any different. Um, global jet demand, even with our forecasted increase this year, um, is still about 600,000 barrels per day lower than 2019 levels. And I think that's where the biggest risk is in terms of demand to the upside. Um, because, you know, once people are able to, and again, it might take a little bit of time because there's still restrictions around visas and uh, PCR tests and so on and so forth. But once those are relaxed, uh, JET is probably going to be uh, a huge kind of 
pick up in terms of demand. Um, and this, I think, in my view at least, is probably a very contentious uh, topic, demand always is, but this year more so. Um, I, I am a very strong believer that China will actually lift all, you know, it's, it's definitely a boat that was going to lift the tide because uh, sorry, the tide that lifts off the boat the, the other way around. Because for me, it's not just about China reopening, it's the multiplier effect China has in the region. In Korea, 25% of Korean exports go to China. 20% of Thailand's tourism is China. The same numbers are applicable for Vietnam. So it is that multiplier effect in, on Asia, which I really do believe the market is underappreciating. The market remains myopically focused on rising US interest rates, the impact it has on US economy and Europe European economies. And I'm not saying it's wrong in focusing on that. I think it is important. We in our numbers have already factored in a, a, you know, a huge drop in European demand this year, a drop in US demand year on year this year. So you know we have OECD demand declining by 700,000 barrels per day. But that's why you know our net global increase in demand is only 1.3. And I say only uh, because I do know some others have bigger numbers. And I would say the risk to our numbers is definitely to the upside. But that's where the kind of issue becomes where, you know, markets tend to be quite West focused or Western focused. So it naturally it tends to be very much around oh, the US interest rates are rising and so on and so forth. Whereas I, I think this is going to be an Asia year. It's going to be Asia that's kind of really leading us out. And that's the last region that hasn't recovered post COVID. So that, that would be my number one thing. But linked to that, uh, for me, the biggest stress is actually on the refining system much more than crude oil, especially right now. And refining gets technical. People don't want to talk about it. And I'll, I'll try and keep it as brief as possible because this is the double whammy on refining we're facing right now. So we've had the China recovery. The importance of the China recovery is not just the volume of demand that you're getting, but it's also because of the jet recovery for the first time since 2019, we finally have inter-product competition. You know, firstly, it was all diesel, then gasoline came back, jet was still lagging. This year, we're going to have gasoline, diesel, jet, all fight at the refinery level saying, give me the yield, I need the yield to be, you know, for, for me to meet the demand. So that's one aspect of it. The other aspect of it with China reopening, they are also exporting less. They've reduced their product export quotas again. So refining in 2019, we had five to 8 million barrels per day potentially of excess refining capacity. We shut down 3 million barrels per day over COVID. And then China changed this policy and said, hey, we are not going to export any, uh, pro not any, but reduce our exports massively. So on paper, we still have about a good 4 million barrels per day of excess capacity in China, but they, they're not exporting all of that, right? This is happening just when we are about to lose Russian products from the 5th of Feb, far more significant than crude. And in the interest of time, I'll keep this very short. And yes, there's a lot of focus on diesel. Yes, diesel will be a problem in placing all the Russian diesel, but it can be blended. There will be some homes for it. Gasoline is probably the trickiest one because Russia exports two thirds of VGO to the world. VGO is effectively vacuum gas oil that gets made into gasoline. And nobody else other than them in the Middle East really exports much of that. And NAFTA is the same problem. So we are going to be losing feedstock from Russia. So I, I really worry about summer inflation this year again with regards to kind of at least gasoline and, and again, China reopening. So those would be the two big stresses, I would say, and ultimately much more on the product side than crude oil per se. You can have crude at 100 even or 90, 100, whatever the number is, even if it's higher, but you can have products at $150, $180 flat price diesel and gasoline. And that's what ultimately we pay for at the pump, right? And the final point I would say is the lack of SPR. Governments have used SPR last year. We had 220 million barrels of crude, 50 of products. That's done now, right? We might have a little bit here and there, but that just means that, you know, this is going to be a tight market right throughout this year. Uh, but like I said, for us, it's more on the product side, at least in the first half before the new Middle Eastern refineries come up, but doesn't mean crude's going to be weak. It's just going to be this tension that we continue to go back and forth between. Uh, thanks very much, Amrita, for that uh, great summary and the focus on Asia. Hans, over to you. 
Yes, thank you very much. And also, uh, thank you for inviting me and having me uh, like uh, last year. And uh, yeah, I was just thinking that the last year when we had this same panel session, we we saw the markets already tightening, especially in the, in the gas markets. But we obviously had no idea that we would see these kind of record levels we've seen in the past summer. So uh, in that case, yeah, it, it, it was yeah really a big surprise, I think, to all of us. Um, and obviously, that was largely linked to the, the Russian-Ukraine uh, situation. Um, but um, it, it already, of course, started before, and that has more to do with the investments and the lack of investment in uh, not only in fossil fuels, because we see that um, a lot of investment have been cut back uh, significantly in the past few years, but also the investments in renewable energy. I mean, they have been stepped up, but not enough to compensate for the, the drop in the investments in the, the fossil fuel uh, sector. Um, at the same time, yeah, well, we see there's a quite some, some issues on the supply side. Uh, we saw, as, as uh, Amrit also indicated, demand is picking up, especially from China. Um, and uh, yeah, that, that of course, uh, yeah, creates some, some issues for, for the coming year. Um, and looking more into the natural gas again, we see it's quite some, some solutions. Eh? I mean, uh, we, we try to increase energy efficiency. Uh, we use the alternatives, uh, the coal, uh, oil, and nuclear uh, for, for uh, our molecules and electrons here in Europe. Um, also more LNG imports. Um, and that, of course, is the big question. How long can we maintain this high level of imports in Europe, especially if uh, China starts to uh, to open up again and uses their, uh, their contracts again? Um, we also see some focus on local production, uh, although I'm settled here in the Netherlands, and I can say, assure you that we will probably not increase the production here. Um, and of course, we saw some temporary uh, solutions from the European leaders with imp implementing this uh, price cap or that will be implemented in, in February, which in my view is no, no solution because they're actually trying to fix something that was not broken, the markets, and they do not tackle the, uh, the market scarcity. Um, uh, the longer term uh, investments are also seen. Uh, we, we see the, the, the Fit for 55 and the, 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 the policy to, inc to, yeah, to step up the, the investments in renewable energy, not only here in Europe, but also the Inflation Reduction Act in the US and uh, also in the five-year plan in China, you see more and more investments into renewables. But it, 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 yeah, like I also mentioned before, it, it gives some friction. Uh, on, on one hand side, you see the, the reality versus ambition. You see uh, local versus global. Um, which I think can be summarized with local ambition versus the global reality. Uh, I mean, we all know where we have to be in 2050, but um, I think last year really created a lot of awareness on, on how difficult this will be. And uh, yes, we will need to speed up, but at the same time, we will need to keep an eye on these global challenges at the same time. Thank you. Thanks very much, Hans. And finally, uh, Saad, over to you to give your observations, and then we'll get into deeper dive. Great. Thanks, Ed. Uh, and thanks uh, to IEF and GARP for having me here. So I think just big picture for me, where we're, what we've been talking about is really the idea of going away from cycles to spikes, meaning moving away from sort of the long-term, uh, you know, long cycle overinvestment, underinvestment that we've seen previously, and to something that is much more, that is you know, highly volatile and running up against some very sharp um, movements. And why do we say that? Well, if you look at last year, really, you had rates, Russia, and restrictions. So the U.S. rates, lack of gas from Russia really impacting Europe and inflation there, growth there, and then the restrictions around property and COVID and movement in China. Now we're moving to a resurgent China, a relieved Europe, and a resilient U.S., and a big backdrop for all this is how much cash everyone is sitting on. And if you look at it, the Chinese excess savings of about $780 billion last year, Europe about $520 billion last year, and the US about $4 trillion. So those cash balances put us in a very, very different position from the last time we were looking at a recession back in 2008, where you're not leveraged, you have the safety cushion, and now everyone thing is, is starting to reopen. So I think when everyone was looking at the balances for this year, as they were doing them towards the end of last year, they were really pricing in a very sharp recession in a lot of places. Europe in particular looked like it was heading maybe for an industrial depression. Um, and you know, and China looked like maybe it was still going to be under lockdown. But as we've heard, we're already starting to see energy demand pick up, already starting to see movement pick up. We were already starting to see that on the metal side, where the second half actually was looking much, much better than people anticipated in China. You know, property was weak, but outside of that, everything else was still looking like it was pretty good. And we think that momentum really continues into this year. And for me, when we look at it and we say, you know, how much of an impact could China really have in terms of, you know, we're talking about jet demand, about global movement. 
Well, just to put it in context, in 2019, there were about 154 million Chinese tourists mm -hmm. who went and spent about $255 billion globally. So that's going to be a big impact. Um, certainly here in Europe, I think you can see already the service PMIs kind of turning up, and that's before we get to summer and summer tourism coming. So once that all really starts, I think what we're starting to look at is going to be a significantly stronger recovery than perhaps people were, were penciling in. Um, and to me, that's where I think there is a lot of upside to the current forecasts that are out there, um, because there is going to be that pent-up demand that's coming. Now, having said that, where I think does concern me to go back to Ed's original question about where where would you know where would the concern be, is that all of that is taking place against this backdrop of structural underinvestment that we've seen for almost a decade now, really starting in back in 2014, um, and it's across commodities. Uh, we saw that, you know, I, I think most vividly last year in terms of gas, where the lack of reliable and realistic alternatives to, you know, dependence on Russia meant that there was no buffer, there was no cushion really in the system, um, other than some demand destruction and thankfully weather that bailed us out really, I'd say here in Europe. Um, but beyond that, you know, you don't you don't have that flex in the system. And the same thing on oil markets and what Amita talked about um, on the refining side, you know, we've seen almost 4 million barrels a day of global refining capacity um, be reduced, but that's a net number uh, because where you look at it is a lot of that capacity that has come on, has come on in China and India and the Middle East to a degree, but in particular for China, the capacity that's come on has been heavily geared towards petrochemicals, not necessarily road transport fields or, or other transport fields. So if you're in a position this year where we're saying we're at the lowest uh, you know, levels we've been at, um, certainly you look at East Coast diesels inventories, for example, we're at the lowest we've ever been. Right, coming into the year and going forward. So, where is where is that replenishment going to come from? Where is that supply going to come from? Um, and it's not clear. And that's again why you're seeing margins, refining margins, already coming into the year at historic highs for this time of year, um, looking very very strong. You know, speaking to that lack of capacity. And then we look at the upstream side, and we say. You know, again, companies have been underinvesting because that's what their the market has told them to do. They have not been rewarded as CEOs or as uh, you know as boards for really for increasing capex for investing in their traditional core business. So more and more of them have started to pivot away towards clean energy spending. You can see that the overall level of spending has dropped to about forty percent of what it was back in two thousand fourteen. That in turn is leading to a real lack of reserve replacement. So for the last three years, we've been running substantially under 100% reserve replacement ratio, meaning you're you're producing a lot more than you are than you're finding um, and developing. And that again puts us, I think, in a structural situation that really could lead to some some significant volatility as we run up against these constraints. Um, but volatility, well, you know, maybe good for for trading companies, is not necessarily good for long term investment decisions, right? So if you're if you're the CEO of a large company saying, okay, well, I'm looking to make a longer term investment decision, but I can't because the curve is moving around so much. How do you then actually go out and justify that to your shareholders and to everyone else? So that's really my concern, but it's also not just on the energy side. You know, I've talked about oil and we talked a little bit about gas, but when we talk about it, then what do we what are we moving to, which is the rest of the energy transition? Well, we're underinvested there as well. You know, this isn't really the focus of this panel, but the idea being there isn't enough copper, there aren't enough projects in the pipeline. The projects that are there are taking significantly longer to come on. So instead of five to six years, they're now taking 11 plus years to come on. There are a third smaller. Um, and for those of you who may not know, I mean, the, the reason I'm talking about copper is without copper, there is no energy transition. There's about four to five times as much copper in EVs um, as there's a traditional internal combustion engine. You know, you have about 20 times as much zinc, nine times as much copper in renewables such as wind, you know, and so if we're not investing in that either, then you can move to that rapidly as well. So there's this real trade-off. And ultimately what I'm concerned about is because of this lack of investment, if we do see demand really start to come back, you know, whether it's this year and coming years, um, that you risk the spike that in a sense maybe cannibalizes the funds that you need for the energy transition. And that to me is a real risk for, for the global economy. Thanks very much. We now have had a, a rich array of issues put on the table. Um, and I think I'm going to start with one of the things that uh, you saw was talking about and uh, test everybody on the panel on this. Namely, uh, you said that we have been in a world of spikes, a world in which there's inadequate supply uh, is by definition a world of, sp of spikes. Where is the, it might the world be a little bit too complacent this year in thinking that uh, 
uh, that there uh, might not be some spikes. And, and maybe, Hans, I'll turn to you as the first person to look at that, given what we know about the LNG supply going to Europe, as you as you already said, uh, uh, and as uh, others have indicated, China's demand can change the nature of the gas market overnight. But uh, what do you see in terms of spikes there and, and elsewhere in the world ahead this year? Yeah, well, if we look at natural gas, and that's my main focus, I think, for today, um, well, I mean, we are extremely lucky, lucky that we have such a mild winter so far. That means that European inventories are at 77%, um, which is above the five-year average. And uh, uh, yeah, that, that makes that we probably, when, when this winter is over in April and we start building the new inventories, we are probably still yeah, at 50% or higher, depending on a bit on how February will be. Um, uh, that also means that Europe is less dependent on, on the amount of LNG inflows as we have seen last year. And of course, uh, then we still had some Russian gas that will be lower. Um, but yeah, like I said, uh, for, for the moment, I think luck is the, 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 the key word so far. And that will prevent most likely uh, the, the huge spikes we've seen last year. Also, one of the reasons we saw this huge spike last year was the, the, the call from European leaders that they say they would fill the inventories at all costs. Well, that is, of course, a nice buying signal for hedge funds and other um, more speculative participants. Uh, I, I, I hope, I assume that they have learned from that and will not come with such kind of signals again. Um, but we also will see that, um, uh, yeah, the, how, how the market will, will react in the, in the yeah, uh, with, with the more supplied markets. So less spikes for this year, I would say, but it will remain uncertain, at least in 25 till 26 when uh, more LNG is coming to the market from the supply side. And until then, it, it's basically a tight market. Um, hopefully not as tight as we've seen last year and, and without the huge spikes, but uh, it's, it's for also for sure that we will not return to the price levels we've seen uh, before this whole crisis started. Amrita, where do you, where do you anticipate spikes? I, I think the spikes, to an extent, again, going back to what I was talking about with products, um, much more on gasoline, I, I, uh, at least this summer. Um, it's not that gasoline is cheap right now. It's already trading, like, say, 20, almost $30 above Brent uh, in terms of cracks. Uh, but could that really go, you know, we've seen diesel cracks trading at $60, $80 last year. Yeah, we can absolutely see that. We have new capacity coming online in the second half, so that will help. But they are very distillate focused as opposed to gasoline focused. So if I had to choose one, I would say products. But I also agree with Hans. I, I do think, you know, gas, I, it, there's a lot of complacency in Europe right now because, again, all of us have said we, we locked out. Uh, and by the way, it is pretty cold right now, uh, despite, uh, I mean, it's still January, right? Feb is still ahead of us. Um, but I, I really worry about, on the gas side from European policymakers, this issue around, oh, you know, winter is done, we're absolutely fine. So uh, next winter, a potential spike in gas again, if we just haven't built enough inventory through the summer. Um, and I mean, crude is already trading at elevated levels. Um, could we see some, yeah, some instances where, again, if there's no SPR to really play with, um, could like if you get, say, a hurricane season, which shuts in US production, uh, and the market is going to be quite tight at that point, could we see spikes? Yes, but if I had to choose, I would say gasoline and then win next winter natural gas would be my two choices. Right, but as you've indicated, weather is an entirely exogenous variable yeah. uh, of which nobody has any control. So, any control uh, over, no, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Saad, you're the one who introduced the, the, uh, the likelihood of spikes and you pointed out to the ones we've lived through last year. Uh, what do you have in mind when you think about spikes? Well, look, I think, again, I think a lot of people coming into December were really downgrading economic growth forecasts for this year. And my point is, I think if we're looking at it saying, you know, Europe, now people are saying there's no, not going to be a recession in Europe. That's a big delta to what I think people were making in. U.S. maybe is slower than trend growth, but again, doesn't at least today feel like we're headed for a recession. And if China's opening is quicker and stronger than most people thought, you know, we even thought, OK, look, it'll probably be after Chinese New Year that they start to reopen. Obviously, that's been happening now for quite a while. We're hearing that people are moving their normal production starts, um, you know, schedule after Chinese New Year. They're moving it up earlier. You know, to me, that all suggests that there is real possibility for upside uh, demand surprise. Um, whereas on the supply side, I think you look at it, and I think a lot of people have, you know, close to a million barrels a day of U.S. production growth penciled in for this year. You added 138 rigs last year in the U.S. 
good good number of that you added 125 in the first half you only added 12 in the second half and that's consistent with people saying as cost inflation has gone up as labor has gotten harder to find um, and as the return has gotten less certain we're going to dial back in production so unless you start adding rigs starting now, I think you're going to struggle to make that number by the end of the year. Um, we've seen productivity uh, per rig drop off, you know, again, so the assumptions there are, are, aren't, aren't valid anymore. The, the lack of service capacity, the cost of inflation is going to be about 15, maybe 20 percent. And yet you look at CapEx budgets and they're, that's what they're going up by, if at all. So if you're going up by 15, 20 percent, there's no actual real new growth. It's just catching up to what, you know, cost inflation has done. So that's a surprise to me. And then, you know, something we haven't talked about in a while in oil markets are the sort of, you know, usual disruptions that we, we seem to have in oil markets, which is geopolitics, not maybe, you know, outside of Russia. But if you look at Libya, hasn't really gone off for a while. Is there a possibility that we see something happen there? That's a million barrels that could always be at risk. You know, Iran, southern Iraq, you know, that that's always a possibility. We just, we don't know, right? And to me, that's always normally a feature of, of oil markets, just like as Amrita pointed out with hurricanes. You know, if those things happen and you're then taking barrels out of the market, I mean, the IEA, for what it's worth, has already said, look, this year, you know, if you look at the numbers, they're talking about it, about an 800,000 barrel a day deficit played out over the year that ends up being almost 260 million barrels, I think it is, right? That's a lot bigger than the SPR releases and everything that were done last year, right? And that's what allowed crude markets um, in particular to kind of maintain where they were. So you're looking at a much, much bigger deficit. And that, again, is what I would think, what I would see as probably weaker demand assumption than maybe what we're looking at. Um, in fact, I would say definitely weaker than what we're looking at, right? And yet also, again, some very strong growth from from, from the U.S. And, and others. So you you add all that together and you start to say, and, and I, again, I agree with Amrita that I think, you know, products is where this could really start to start to tell. And I think we're already, like I said, we're, we're coming in to the year already very low inventories on diesel, on, on, on gasoline and jet. And to coming into summer, that to me is a real concern because that's the other thing for the second half of the year is everyone is pricing Federal Reserve cuts, you know, in interest rates. If they're not, and if gasoline is, let's say, for argument's sake, going back towards $5, is the Fed going to be in a position to be able to cut rates? Unlikely. They're probably going to want to hold, which is what they've been telling everybody, but no one seems to be listening. And if that's the case, that's a major rethink on the part of the broader market, not just commodities, for people to say, okay, well, what happens to rates? What happens to growth? What happens to everything else? So again, that's where I think we're seeing some real volatility ahead. Um, Ed, can I just add something very quickly to, Go ahead. to what you said? Yeah. Um, just, just to put the SPR into context, and Saad, you've, you've mentioned this. Um, you know, we built last year commercial inventories by about, call it 140, 150 million barrels. But the overall uh, increase or just the give, SPR released uh, about 220 to 230, depending on kind of uh, the, the timing of it, you, if you're including, of crude. So if it wasn't for the SPR, we would have drawn by about 100 million barrels. And I think that's something that is very important to bear in mind for this year. Um, on our numbers, at least, we need to draw by about 50 million barrels or so. And we will go back to the very, very low levels of stocks we had in the first half of last year. That's when, you know, SPR hadn't quite hit. The SPR really started to come from May on. So I think that is just worth bearing in mind uh, for the kind of crude complex overall, because you you know you ask questions about potential spikes. Um, yes, governments can come in and do a little bit here and there, but the SPR was such a distortionary factor last year. I just worry that the market's kind of forgotten about the fact that we would have been drawing massively had it not been for the SPR. The Russia invasion was actually additive for crude because we had SPR and we didn't lose Russian production. This year, it could be the exact opposite. Yeah, and sorry, and just to then also add to that. I think I think that's a great point, but really quickly, then that's a bullet that was already fired last year, as I made a suggestion, because also now you have a Republican House who have said very clearly that we're not going to support further SPR release. In fact, we would like to support buying back in barrels. I don't know if that actually happens, but that net delta again is is is, is pretty significant. Um, and so you know, we'll see how that goes. Uh, I'd like to remind those of you who are in uh, part of the video, part of what we're doing. If you have a question, and I see from the faces around me, somebody's, some people do have questions, raise your hand um, or intervene. But uh, I prefer you raise your hand um, with the, uh, the monitor so I can see you and, um, and we'll get to that discussion. I'd like to, uh, these are all controversial issues and I'd like to do a little bit of a deeper dive in some of them. Uh, Amrita, going back to your initial opening remarks, 
uh, and Katie, I'll come to you in a second, but uh, going to your initial opening remarks on uh, China and also on refining. Um, could you share with us uh, your, uh, your medium term views on both of those? So uh, where does China's demand go? Does it, uh, does it go back to a growth pattern? It was not in a growth pattern before the pandemic. Uh, I think uh, I'm right in saying that their demand for diesel actually peaked in 2015. It was a down since then. Um, I think it's right to say that they had a significant amount of fuel switching from, uh, from uh, natural gas to diesel over the last year when we had that uh, increase in BTU uh, equivalent of diesel prices. But where do you see Chinese demand uh, on the transport fuel side? going forward is the diesel going to more than recover and given the rate of growth of electric vehicles what do you see as a turning point for uh basically all motor vehicle fuel demand in the country um so i and you're exactly right i think transportation fuels hasn't been the driver of chinese demand right of the la over the last few years it's been petrochemicals 100% it's been plastics, it's been bitumen. It, it's funny, the bottom of the barrel has done very well because of infrastructure projects and so on. Last year, the infrastructure projects helped diesel as well, but the amount of electrification they've done um, does cap that upside. I'd say this year and potentially some of next year, the pent up demand recovery will support transportation fuels because you're just coming from a very low base and you're just going back to 2019 levels. But after that medium term, um, our view remains that the driver for Chinese demand is not going to be transportation, it's going to be petrochemicals. Yeah, just on that for, for a second, uh, if some people are right in thinking that the amount of fuel switching they had in 2021 and 2022 uh, of uh, nat gas to diesel, and that's coming off now, switching back to nat gas, particularly in trucking, um, how does that affect your thinking on um, a million and a half or whatever the number is, incremental demand coming from China itself? So, no, so for China, we've only got a 900,000 barrels per day of growth. The global okay. number was 1.3, yeah. Uh, so we yeah. have factored that in. We factored some of that kind of coming off uh, from the diesel side, but we do think, so for us, by the way, gasoline and jet lead the recovery. It's not going to be diesel in China. If you also look at the reduction in exports, uh, it's gasoline and jet that's getting more reduced more than what diesel is getting reduced. So that's why mm -hmm. I know there's a lot of hype. No, hype is the wrong word. I think people should be concerned about diesel because losing Russian diesel is going to be hard, but I am not as worried about diesel tightness. It will tighten, but the other side, the gasoline side for me is much harder because um, Chinese, the recovery is much more going to be around the transportation fuel around gasoline. It's going to be around people rather than diesel. Now, just before we go to the people who have their hands up, uh, Hans and Asad, do you have anything to comment on what Amrita just went through on China or um, will you leave it at that? Yeah, no, look, I think I think that's right where I do think the focus, especially right now, is gasoline and jet because of all the, the trips and everything that's, that are being taken. And you can't, you know, you can't even get a train ticket. Um, so people have, have really driven home this time in the way that they I think they didn't uh, in previous years. But also, I think your know, trucking has fallen off because production has fallen off because of the lull right now. And it really, again, it comes back to I think the Chinese government has made very clear that now they're switching back to a pro-growth agenda in a way that they have not done in a long time, where they were focused on debt reduction, you know, debt management in, in the economy as a whole, then focusing again on common prosperity. So how do we go after, um, you know, really kind of, in a sense, trying to boost the demographics on a long-term basis, build a larger internal market. And now this year, the message very clearly is growth. And that I think is going to mean a lot of infrastructure development, a re, uh, you know, a rebounding of the property sector, you know, loosening of restrictions there, turning back to exports, all of that really starting to go again. And so I think it may not be the leader, but I wouldn't totally discount Chinese digital demand this year either. Hans, any comments? Uh, just on the on the refinery capacity uh, capacity here in, uh, in 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 northwestern Europe, I think that that's pretty okay. So we don't see any shortages there. But obviously, there will be uh, uh, more difficulties with the refineries, uh, which yeah uh, are dependent on on the Russian in, uh, in, inflow of of, uh, of crude. And uh, there we might see shortages. And of course, that will push up prices. And that effect of the higher prices will also be something which can be affected, or can be seen here in in northwestern part of Europe. Thanks so much. Okay, Katie, over to you. Well, thank you. And thank you, Garp and 
and folks for having me here. I'm, my name is Katie Bays. I'm director of sustainable investment with the energy consulting firm Adam and Team. And Amrita and Saad in particular, listening to you both speak, it makes me think of the unstoppable force meeting the immovable object, uh, where you know the unstoppable force maybe is the consumer, especially the Chinese consumer, and the immovable object is the energy uh, complex's ability to respond to changes in short-term demand. And so I guess I wondered, or, or kind of as I think about this, especially Saad, your comments on the uh, accumulated savings that consumers have coming out of the pandemic, you know, maybe the takeaway I should have is that folks will weather these high prices, but they won't be happy about them. And so to that point, I kind of wanted to ask folks, you know, Hans and everyone, what what do you think happens in the global market if consumers endure this period of high prices, maybe with some frustrations, but uh, but endure them nonetheless, and, and particularly given the existence of alternative technologies, whether that's EVs, heat pumps, you know, Zoom, I don't know, what the, the opportunities that folks have to insulate themselves from high energy costs what you know, I would love to hear your kind of medium-term predictions about how this period could influence uh, either consumers or politics or or investment. So that's that's my question. It's got no clear answer, but I would love to hear what you think. Yeah, if maybe I'll, I'll start. But look, I think this you're exactly right, and I used exactly that phraseology last year, but more for the fundamentals of the commodity markets, you know, maybe a little bit less on oil because of the SPR releases, but across copper, zinc, everything else, where you had the immovable object of what was happening on these tightening fundamentals, lack of long-term supply capacity, and the irresistible force of these three big macro headwinds. And now, you know, if those have gone away, then we're starting to expose these cracks, and now the, the immovable object is coming to the fore. And I think higher prices, though, is maybe what we need for a while, right? Because that is what then will incentivize, finally, companies to go out and, and invest in the capacity that we need. I think, you know, we've heard so much about, okay, well, peak demand is coming. That's why, you know, companies like Shell are saying, well, I'm not being rewarded for investing in my core business. So therefore I'm going to transition more towards a clean energy company. So my oil and gas production is going to decline every year from this, you know, this year on out. Um, and, you know, again, we see that across most of these energy companies. So at some point though, then the shareholders are going to come back and say, well, actually we, we're looking at getting more of a more of a return and this business seems like it may be doing that but maybe it's not shell maybe to some of the smaller players and whomever it is but that investment needing to happen but i'll give you an example it's one of the big uh, shale company ceos i won't say which one but his point was i don't care if the oil price doubles i'm not drilling until my share price doubles right and again so maybe high prices will be the signal that then incentivize companies to rethink how they invest in in this which is what we need because you know whatever your your estimate of peak demand is it's probably not in the next couple of years and yet we still need fuel you know my, my heuristic on this is you shut the entire global economy down in march and april 2020 you still use about 90 million barrels a day of oil you know so it's it's very hard to go from the 100 ish level to even 90 let alone to wherever down there and we're not investing commensurate with that level um, let me just uh, i'll stick to saad's thought process what i'll add is you know, as an industry, if you ask me um, where we should do more work, and by the way, I'm not saying this, job because this is, you know, IEF organized, but the work you guys are doing in terms of demand is like, as an industry, we are terrible at forecasting demand. Absolutely terrible. We do a much better job on supply, right? It's easier. That's the reality of it. Demand is opaque. It comes from, you know, lots of parts of Asia where data collection is bad. Because why do we have these cycles, right? Why is refining such a problem right now? Because for the last, I mean, it's been over capacity, China's policy change, whatever else. But the reality is, like Saad said, Shell was talking about peak demand in 2020. Right. And it almost doesn't matter if it's transportation and petrochemicals. Of course, the quality of the crude will change, et cetera, et cetera. But it's ultimately liquids molecule. And Hans will agree with this as well in terms of gas. Right. We've gone through this period where, oh, um, and by the way, IEA still said this, they, uh, Fatih said this at Davos as well, saying we should not invest in oil and gas because that's not uh, in line with one degree. So the, the fundamental issue is in some ways, you know what, we need high prices for a while because the industry needs to understand that oil demand is stickier 
than we give it credit for. And therefore, let's reassess the investment. Like, I'm not saying we shouldn't be investing in green energy. We need to triple, like quadruple the amount we're investing. But if your starting point is wrong about how much you need to invest to swap out liquids, then the whole equation is wrong. And I mean, we're not even close to doing what we are meant to do anyways, right? So fundamentally, high oil prices will actually be the solver. I don't know what, whether shareholders will change. Like, I don't disagree with you, Saad, in terms of what you're saying, that production grow, uh, rises. My feeling is, you know, talking to one of the biggest CEOs of an oil major without naming names. And I, he said, no, oh, this is the best margin I've had, et cetera, et cetera, and off, offshore. And I said, so why are you not investing more? And he said, well, I want to remain CEO for the next five years, right? So I don't yeah. know whether shareholders will change, but at least if as an industry we can get better at forecasting demand better, hopefully that changes you know, the narrative a little bit and allows for the correct amount of investment, or at least so we hope. Yeah, and just sorry to pick up on that before, Hans, I'm sorry if I'm cutting off, but the, the idea being, so in 2008, in uh, basically information technology, so Facebook, Google, and Netflix, and energy were the exact same percentage weight of the S&P, 15%, right? Last year, that former group was 30% and energy was 2%, right? And that's the signal that's coming from the market. So, you know, when does that start to shift? And I think it is once the returns are there, which is why then maybe prices have to come in, right? Where people go, okay, hold on. We can't give an infinite PE ratio to all these tech companies or even to Tesla, which we're saying, okay, because there's 0% interest rate, all of a sudden money costs something, show me the money. But then what you have is, as you say, you have all these CEOs are saying, I'm getting paid more for each barrel I'm not producing, right? Those, so why would I go out and produce? Th those of you who know me know that I'm, you know, doing everything I can not to open my mouth and say anything to engage in this conversation. But uh, I will, for one moment, um, make a couple of observations that are slightly different from those uh, that others have made. One um, is that uh, I think it's universally recognized in the equity community, equity and the analytical community, that if you're sitting on short cycle oil and you're not pumping it when you can, there's something irrational going on. And we've already seen uh, that irrationality unfolding in the privatization of some companies where the original owner said, hey, you know, I'm the main shareholder. I'm going to make a lot more money if I drill more. So I'm buying back everybody else's shares. And that's what I'm going to do. And there's not just one company that's doing that. There are others as well. Uh, the other observation I would like to make is, yeah, over a 75 year period of time, we have very good data on what demand is versus GDP. And it's been on a slope downward. And that slope downward has been exactly the same in emerging markets as it has been in advanced economies. Uh, you go back to a, a period of time, like say 1970 to 75, uh, for every increase in GDP in much of the world, the world as a whole, there was more than a 1% increase in oil demand. Uh, at the uh, beginning of the pandemic, that had dropped, that ratio dropped by 50%. And there are policies in place that are accelerating that drop. So. Uh, yeah, we don't know about a lot of things about demand, but we do have a kind of big historical database on it. Um, and uh, I don't want to get into a debate, uh, but I do want to say, you know, we want to have those who have their hands up have a chance to speak. So, Shah, over to you. Thank you. Uh, Ed, it's great to see you as always. And Beth, thank you for inviting uh, me to join. Um, I wanted to go back, you know, Saad, you made a couple of very interesting observations and Amrita also. One was about the spikes uh, versus cycles, right? And uh, the other one was your astute observation, Saad, about 15% S&P versus 3% now, right? Because that's, so what I want to tie it back to is that- um, I, I, I want to interrupt you, Shah, just for one second. The last time we had the, uh, the energy companies, the oil companies in particular, 3% of the S&P, they also decided not to invest. That was the period 98 to 2003. And, you know, it said, hell, you know, we're going to get investments from Iran, from Iraq, from Nigeria, from Libya and Venezuela. Why should we invest if they're going to do all of that capital spending when we can enjoy higher margins? And look what happened. So yes, yes. Just, just a note on that. Go ahead. You're absolutely right. So, you know, the spikes are connected to the real economy. Okay. So this has happened for supply chain disruption, whether you're talking about Fukushima or whether you're talking about Texas, or you're talking about Long Beach not being able to accommodate shipments coming in, right? You had Celanese uh, just lift its force majeure 
on asset toe in, in, in China. So there are the real economy pieces that are coming in here, which are causing those spikes. And you talk about mechanisms. I, I put it, this is a realm where Ed is involved, is that um, you know, the policy issue, it's not just the market smoothing out and saying, oh, there is a spike, but we need mechanisms, right? Ed, as you know, from the Iraq situation, right? Where you've got to have buffers or capabilities to work with the spikes. They're not going to just resolve themselves because um, we just say, oh, give it three more days or three more months and the market will resolve yeah. it. It'll cause real pain, unemployment and dislocation, right? So the, 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 the uh, asset allocation process for companies, whether you're talking about a Dow or you're talking about a Chevron, is an important consideration. And that's sometimes driven by compliance or agreement between groups to allocate resource in a particular way, such as, for example, for nearshoring, as we're talking about a massive shift in these things. Chevron just allocated 35 billion for stock buyback, exactly so, like you said, and Ed, as you said. So I think these are issues, but I think there's a role. It's not just market smoothing out and dealing with spikes as an aberrance, right? But it's really, there's no mechanism in place and that's why we had disruptions over the last two years, and we will continue to face the risk of significant disruption from spikes because we do not have mechanisms in place. And Ed, I think you have insight from your work in the MENA region. I don't know whether you can talk about it. Do you see capital allocation decisions going in a certain way to alleviate these, you know, create bigger buffers, if you will, at the top and the bottom? Well, I think you see it here and there, but I think you're right. And going back to Katie's uh, observations earlier and Saad's response to it, uh, we, we, I think most of us who've looked at this understand that battery metals are going to be in really short supply uh, and there's going to be inflation that's associated with the energy transition to make the world greener is very copper intensive. It's very cobalt intensive. It's very lithium intensive at the moment, nickel intensive. And uh, no matter what the allocation is to invest more, we're confronting countries that, whether it's Chile or Argentina or, uh, uh, or Peru or other Andean countries that are metal rich, they're having left-wing governments coming in that uh, are doing whatever they can, and Brazil is among them, to uh, stop the spending that had been going on to husband it in terms of uh, monopolizing it by state-owned enter enterprises. And it's just a guarantee for inflation, greenflation as we like to call it. Um, and with that, you get the yellow jackets in France or you get other consumers around the world who are very displeased. So it's uh, destabilizing internally. And I know we uh, have limited time. So Harry, we do want you to have an opportunity to intervene. So over to you. Yeah. My name is Harry Datatri. I work for Vopak. Um, yeah, one of the nice things of the, the, the session here, I think that if you look at demand, I think it looks a bit more positive. But um, at the same time, it was also mentioned very good in looking at supply. Now, if you look at supply, then yeah, for me, the big question is what is the impact of the price cap going to be? Uh, what scenarios could you uh, identify in it? And in terms of scenarios, yeah, can think about the volume you can think about the areas that will be affected but also how the markets are affected by it so i know it's a very easy uh, question to ask but with a lot of variables but it's really a wild card eh? you look forward uh, to the coming period so maybe some comments on it uh, maybe yeah, I'd, hans, I, I, I'd like to hear from hans and the others I, i'd like to make a comment on it uh, uh the why do, why do people allocate to commodities It's part of their investment portfolio? Um, and you know, go back to portfolio investment theory uh, as was analyzed. Uh, portfolio managers should have commodities as part of it, whether it's 8% or 12%, depends on the year, depends on uh, whether the market is backward dated or not. Uh, but definitely the main reason to invest in commodities is that when you live in a world of wild cards, having an investment in commodity. Commodities respond to, in a wild card environment uh, in terms of prices uh, better than 
rates, better than bonds, better than equities. So uh, it, it wild cards should be always familiar to uh, a commodity investor, starting with, you know, why invite, why invest in agriculture uh, commodities, uh, grains? You do so because you don't know what the weather's going to be like, and having part of your portfolio in that can can make you overperform uh, in, in, as long as the, the uh, issue is uh, is managed correctly. But uh, in closing remarks, I think you're having raised that wild card issue uh, gives us a chance to go kind of in uh, a different order from where we started, but starting with Hans uh, and uh, Saad, and then Amarita will get the, the last word. Um, you know, what 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 do you think of when you think about the wild cards as they affect investments and as they affect consumers? Yeah, well, if, if I can relate it to this, this price gap in, in, in general, but uh, I mean, it, it, it's a bit strange solution. Uh, like I mentioned in my introduction, uh, the problem is at the market. The problem is scarcity. So therefore, this, this whole um, tool is, is, is trying to fight something which is it's not basically the problem. And on top of that, it, it's a seller's market. Um, I mean, uh, so, so that's already difficult if you want to yeah, come with all kinds of um, uh, uh, yeah, uh, needs from, from a demand side while it, it's a seller's market. And of course, uh, this comes with the risk of lower liquidity in the TTF markets, which is not good for prices. Lower liquidity means probably higher volatility, uh, and that's not for, good for, for, for the price in general. Um, and it also pushes um, people away from the market, so more OTC trading, so it's, it's less visible, which also comes with extra risk. So in, in, yeah, in, in more multiple uh, ways you, you can look at it, I think this is, uh, yeah, not, uh, let's, let's say, uh, a, a difficult wildcard, to put it in your words. So. Well, it's it's funny, you know, you mentioned 2003. That's actually when I started in, in, uh, in the commodity markets. And since then, obviously, prices have done what they've done. But, you know, we have seen first all the concerns about peak supply. And then I remember 2007 onwards, everyone was talking about peak demand and we've reached peak demand. Obviously, neither of those things came true. I think where we are right now is really in a peak deliverability issue, right? It's not, and this again is across commodities. It's not that we don't have enough in the ground. It's that we have not invested in a timely enough fashion to be able to deliver these things on a short enough cycle, given where we think demand is, right? So the question is, how do we then reconcile those competing factors? I think that's what the world is looking at. And I think that's maybe where we get to this idea of spikes, because I don't think we've gone through a period, at least in recent history, again, maybe back from 86 onwards, where again, we hadn't invested. So there was no buffer. So when the spike comes, it has to get to a level that causes some pain, enough pain to cause demand destruction, you fall back down, but that there is this underlying constraint. So these lows get higher for a while until you can invest and catch up to do that. And so to me, again, this is where these wild cards do start to, to emerge. Um, and, but the uncertainty around this, whether it's price caps, whether it is geopolitics, whether it is all these other things that then interfere with this, really makes it a big question, right? Um, and then last word I would say on this, to go back to something I think you alluded to, but it was about investors and about positioning and where people are. And last year, in a sense, fundamentals didn't really matter is what people were looking at with the dollar and with rates, right? Why? The FX market daily turnover is $6.5 trillion. The oil paper market is ballpark $65 billion. Copper is $6.5 billion, right? So you're stepping down in orders of magnitude, a little bit of allocation into or out of the dollar swamps our markets. This year, if the dollar has turned and people suddenly turn and say, look, well, we think you know, maybe inflation isn't going away. Maybe there is a scarcity issue. Maybe we need to start to reallocate to this. That could be a real game changer. Thanks. Amrita. Yeah, I mean, I think Saad put it so eloquently on, on, on this issue, right? I think I couldn't agree more. We've never had scarcity of oil in terms of underground, right? It's absolutely above ground issues. But this is where the price gap actually does make it problematic because we are adding layers of complexity, right? And Harry, to your question, I mean, the crude price gap, fine. The products one, they haven't even decided on the level. They are talking about having a positive price gap as in the products that trade positive versus negative or clean versus dirty. What do you do with NAFTA? It's trading below crude right now but just about and about to flip over it's a mess right and i think the if underlying we don't have buffer in whether it's spare capacity we have a little bit in the middle east or a little bit in inventories but let's assume that kind of gets run down these issues then just add to it the biggest impact or the fallout of price cap is on freight 
shipping, right? How are you going to move all of this oil and products around? Because we just don't have enough vessels. Where's the insurance going to come from? So that's why the spikes just get, again, for a lack of better words, spikier, right? Because whenever, and by the way, any correlation you do, you can see that as soon as you don't have a buffer, traditional correlations break down and prices just overshoot, right? I think that, and we saw that last year, you know, Brent spreads traded at $5 backwardation. Nobody could even think that was going to happen. And again, those are the risks absolutely present this year. And remember, the one thing I, I, I don't want to end on a gloomy note, but I just want to say this, for Europe to be this complacent, it's all fine. It's all well and good when China wasn't in the market. When China comes back, good luck getting anything because China is going to bid it away. I'd like to uh, thank everybody for being with us. Um, I, I, I'd like to note as part of this conclusion on wild cards that Russia, Ukraine is a central part of it. Russia has been, if you take 30 different commodities, number one, two or three supplier in the world. Um, and the distortions in the market as a result of action and reaction in the, uh, that market has affected all, all commodities. Um, Joe, back to you in case you have any final comments to make. Well, thanks very much. And, and thanks, Amrita, for the little plug on the work we're, we're doing here. You know, we, we like to say at the IF, we focus on markets, not models because the models uh, sometimes uh, have some wrong assumptions. But uh, that's why I think this uh, markets update was so uh, helpful and informative, and we'll continue to do more of this uh, with our partners at GARP. So uh, thanks again to everybody and listening. And uh, Rich, you want to say some concluding comments? Uh, no, thank you very much. This is, again, a very, uh, really fascinating conversation. And looking forward to um, seeing everybody, hopefully in, in June, in person for change. Thank you. Thanks very much, everybody. Thank you. Thanks. So Beth, thanks for organizing. Sarah, thanks. Much.